Welcome to our show, Astronomy for Everyone. Uh, I'm John Schroer, and this month we're going to talk about the deep sky objects we can see in the wintertime. Uh, joining me in the studio is Four Club member uh, Steve Woody. Nice to have you on the show, Steve. Good to be on the show. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the objects that we can see in wintertime. And we're going to start off with probably the brightest and one of the easiest things you can see in the night sky uh, with just your eyes. Now, when we talk about, um, when we talk about bright objects in the wintertime, such as here, this is a shot of Orion, the hunter you're looking at. The winter sky has some peculiar type of uh, features to it. Um, Steve, can you tell us a little about what it's like to observe in wintertime? What are the benefits? Okay, so um, one of the things that you can basically see in the wintertime is star clusters. You can see stars, but you can also see star clusters. And the wintertime, you have nice, clear, crisp skies. The, the, uh, the stars don't twinkle that much because the air is uh, settled. It's cooler. Uh, it, makes it, it makes it a lot easier. You have a lot of open clusters and globular clusters that you can see in the wintertime. And from high light pollution areas like where I live, um, these, are, these can still be seen without having to you know, leave home. You can be at your home with a small telescope or, or even binoculars. Um, a few of them are naked eye, but probably not in high light pollution areas. And you can see them all winter long. All right. Now, uh, the first image we showed you up there is the belt of Orion the Hunter featuring the stars uh, Al Natak, Al Nilam, and Mintaka. And you can see there is some uh, fuzzy stuff over on the eastern star, uh, Zeta Orionis. And we'll be talking about that in a bit. But the image we want to bring up first off is probably the brightest cloud that's in outer space that you can see with just your eyes. Can you tell us about the uh, Orion Nebula there, Steve? Yeah, this is the Great Orion Nebula. And uh, it's a, a, a big, I mean, just absolutely humongous cloud of uh, gas, mostly gas, uh, that is lit up by a few stars that have formed from it uh, and quite recently. So these are very big, bright stars that emit uh, lots of ultraviolet light, and they're very powerful, and they light up this whole region. Uh, it's a star it, nursery, isn't it? That's right. It's a stellar nursery. So we've got stars that are forming uh, sort of as we speak. The uh, star cluster is very close to us. It's only, and you know, astronomers use these big numbers, it's only 1,500 light years away, right? The yeah. nearest stars are f maybe four light years away. This is 1,500, and that's still nearby. Absolutely. Can you tell us about that little grouping above the, uh, the Orion Nebula, the Running Man Nebula with a cluster in it? OK, so the Running Man Nebula um, uh, is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's certainly smaller. Uh, you really need a, uh, a filter in order to see it, um, but, you, but that allows you, if you have a large enough scope, that allows you to see it even in light polluted areas. The filter will take out most of the light pollution and you get uh, a dark background uh, with just the light of the nebula. And uh, an, uh, uh, an, uh, a um, nebula filter would be uh, an oxygen-3 filter or a hydrogen alpha filter. Um, the, uh, the colors tend to be uh, it, through a telescope, it'll be whatever the color of the filter is. So uh, the oxygen-3 filter is a, a blue-green filter. So everything is blue-green on black. And in the um, hydrogen-alpha filter, it's, it's a red. So it's a red on black. Um, All right. Would that be visible from the Mercury Vapor Observatory from your home? If you have a, a large enough scope. So you typically need a, at least an 8-inch telescope. Um, in order to use these filters, to get enough light to use these filters. But then once you have that, then you can see it from, uh, yeah, the Mercury Vapor Observatory is my driveway. I've got a street light right next to the, uh, right next to the driveway, and I've got a McDonald's across the street and a, another grocery store parking lot across the street. And so, it, you know, it's just a total mess. And the whole thing is situated near Detroit. Um, so, uh, um, you know, it, it can be tough to see stars naked eye. But with a telescope, you can see uh, really great things. A lot of challenges you got to deal with. Right, right. Now, we're going to take Orion's belt, and we're going to go ahead and draw off to the right to probably the, one of the nicest star clusters that you can see. 
Can you tell us about the Pleiades? also known as uh, M45. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the Pleiades is known by a number of different names. In fact, I currently, uh, as, as we're filming anyway, it's for sale, I've got a car named, uh, w which is a, a Subaru. Um, and Subaru, the car company, uh, was, the, uh, was named after this star cluster, the Japanese Name word. Name for the Pleiades. It, yeah, the Japanese word is Subaru. So, um, uh, this cluster has been known for a long time, right? It's naked eye visible, so you can see. Uh, typically, uh, cultures have called it the Seven Sisters, and, and people can see, see, see either six or seven of the brighter stars with your naked eye. Uh, it's pretty obvious in the sky also. Um, so uh, when Galileo first took his little telescope, and it's really small, the um, the telescope is, uh, you know, half an inch in diameter, and it's maybe seven power, and so binoculars, uh, modern binoculars, are better. But he he was able to see about 40 stars, and I've been able to see about 60. So there are over 100 in the Pleiades. Great, Absolutely. great star cluster. Yeah, they're about 400 light years away. So you're seeing them as they were back in 1612. Yeah, just about when Galileo, Galileo. was looking, you know, <laughs> we're seeing. We're seeing them uh, as they were when uh, he was looking. Yeah. And naked eye, they're, they're beautiful to look at. Um, the farther out in the country, in the larger scope, you have a better chance to see that, that wispiness, the nebulosity around it, yeah. which has been theorized by some to be the leftover cloud that produced the stars. But now scientists are saying, no, that's not the case at all. Right. So uh, there are techniques for figuring out how fast the cloud is moving. You can, you, can, you can figure out by taking a picture of the cluster of the stars and then taking a picture of the cluster, say, 10 years later, you can see how the individual stars have moved. Um, there's another technique, which is more complicated, uh, involving radio, that um, lets you figure out where the, where the gas cloud is going. Well, in order for the gas cloud to be part of the cluster, the, they would both have to be moving in the same direction uh, at the same speed, and they're not. So this is a gas cloud that the stars happen to be moving through. It, the stars are just passing through the cloud. That's right. Yeah. Just going through the neighborhood. Yeah. All right. Um, our next image we want to talk about is uh, it's going to be on the left-hand side of Orion, and that's going to be the Rosette Nebula. It's in a constellation that's not very well known because it doesn't have any bright stars compared to Orion or Tars the Bull. And that's Monoceros or Monoceros. That's right. Um, it's the unicorn. And this is the Rosette Nebula. So what can you tell us about the Rosette besides, wow. OK, so the cluster you can see in, in my telescope uh, fairly easily, uh, even from my driveway. Um, but as far as I know, I've never actually seen the, the nebula. You'd need a nebula filter. I have a nebula filter. I just happen to not have gotten around to seeing it. But um, What so about the, in other scopes? So in, in other scopes, well, uh, I, I still ha keep, I, as far as I can tell, my log notes don't show that I've, I've actually seen it. So, you know, maybe I was at a star party and somebody showed me and I forgot. I might not have written it down. But yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a. It's it, not easy to see. It's not that easy. No, it's it's a gorgeous uh, uh, nebula when you do see it, um, and it's pretty easy. Well, I don't know. Pretty easy is uh, a hard thing to say for astrophotography. Astrophotographers uh, uh, like it as a as a target, and uh, and they typically get uh, um, good uh, uh, images. Good images uh, with it. Yeah. The thing is, with it, if you're observing through a telescope, the photons go into your eye, they hit the retina, convert to electrical impulses, they travel down the optic nerve to your brain. But on either film, which almost no one uses anymore, that shows you how old I am, or on uh, digital cameras, CCD uh, cameras, you can accumulate those photons for minutes or up to hours. And you can pick up all the faint color that aren't visible. So um, if you have any questions uh, concerning this or any other topic in the show, um, please sure to write us an email at the address listed below. We're going to take a pause and turn it over to Steve for his Astronomical Term of the Month. So stand by. We'll be back. Welcome back to our show about winter deep sky objects. 
For those of you in the audience that might be confused by that term, a deep sky object is something that exists outside the solar system, the neighborhood of the sun and its little family of planets. Uh, these are either groups of stars called clusters, or they're dark or glowing clouds of gas and dust. And these are distances between oh, several hundred to thousands of light years away. So when you look at them either naked eye or through a telescope, you're not seeing them as they are now, but as they were when the light originally left these objects. With me in the studio, Mr. Steve Whitty. Good to be back, John. And it's nice to have you here. And we're going to pick it up with something appropriate for, uh, for this time of year. That's right. We're going to start with the Christmas tree nebula. So the Christmas tree nebula has a nebula, that is, that it's a gas cloud, but it also has a cluster of stars. These stars aren't terribly bright uh, from a naked eye perspective, none of the stars in uh, Monoceros or Monoceros are terribly bright, but in, um, in a telescope, uh, they stand out. Uh, so uh, the nebula uh, from a, from a, a, a city, uh, light-polluted uh, uh, viewing location, you'll need a, a nebula filter, certainly, to see the nebula portion of, uh, of the Christmas tree. Um, but even without a filter, you can, um, you can see the, uh, the stars, the cluster, uh, in, a, in a telescope. Now, you were telling me beforehand, before the show, that the nebula has an effect on the color that you see of the nebula. It changes the color of the nebula for you. The, right? the filter, right. The filter um, is, uh, just shows a narrow part of the spectrum. So it might be only a little slice of the red, for, for example, uh, a hydrogen alpha filter, or a little slice of the blue or green section of the spectrum. So that's all that it, uh, enters your eyes, and uh, so you typically see just that one color. So the Christmas tree nebula is, in fact? It is absolutely green in, a, in an oxygen-3 filter. Through the eyepiece. That's pretty cool. Now, the next deep sky object we're going to talk about, we're going to be moving north to the constellation of uh, Gemini the Twins. And it's got a uh, rather interesting name, doesn't it, Steve? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the Eskimo Nebula looks like the face of a person inside of uh, an Eskimo costume. At least uh, the early views, almost all of these objects are, are named after the early views, you know, with the smallest telescopes that could actually let you see them. Um, but even at magnification, it still, it still has that Eskimo look. It has look, the, face, the face inside of a, a furry, uh, uh, furry hood. A furry hood, sure. Yeah, you, you look at it here. It's also one of the best known images produced by the Hubble Space Telescope because they took a look, and it still looks like a person inside a furry hood in the dead of winter. It would be an awful big person. That would be very true. Now, the Eskimo is not exactly a close cloud, is it? Uh, no, I, um, I always thought that it was a, um, uh, a planetary nebula. Yeah, but I meant the distance, being close. Oh, oh no, it's not very close. No, it's uh, 4,200 light years away. It's, it's a good distance away. So when you're looking at it in a small scope, um, I mean, you need a, a fair size scope to, to uh, look at it at all. Uh, I haven't looked at it in my 10-inch telescope. Um, I've seen it in a 12 and a half inch, and the 12 and a half inch uh, showed it was fairly dim. It, you know, it showed it, but it was fairly dim. So, well, 4,200 light years away. You know how many miles that is? That's uh, like four trillion miles per light year. So, 25 trillion miles from the Earth. So, that far away, it's going to be a little dim. Something like that. Uh, uh, quadrillion, 25 quadrillion miles. All right. That's right. I keep thinking about the thousand. Yeah, so that would be a million billion. It's far off. Let's put yeah, that one. It's a good distance. <laughs> All right. Now, the next nebula we like to talk actually, the next object we're going to talk about is also in Gemini, but it's not a cloud. It's a, a nice little bunch of stars. Yeah, uh, number 35 on the Messier list is uh, a nice cluster. And uh, Often, often when I'm looking, I've just gotten my telescope aligned. So I've got a, a little computer and I do a star alignment to, so that it can point easily. I'll use M35 as one of the, uh, the objects to look at first because it's fairly obvious. Uh, in this image, it's the 
uh, looser dense, uh, the looser density uh, stars on the left, not the little globular on the right. Um, so uh, it's about 20, 2,800 light years away, but the stars are uh, all pretty bright. And especially, they're all pretty bright compared to the background stars. Yeah, it's lying at the feet of Gemini. And uh, it's called an open cluster because it's just a loose gathering of stars. Um, the little dense patch you saw on the bottom right of our screen, um, that is a globular cluster. It's a tightly packed ball of stars. So those are the basic differences between an open cluster on the left and a little globular, which you can see down in the lower right of our screen. Yes, this globular cluster is, is fairly faint. And often I miss it entirely. M35, it's hard to see it in this picture, but M35, it's the size of the full moon, so it's actually hard to miss. That's pretty big for a deep sky object. It really is. It really is. All right. Now, we're going to continue on this parade of, uh, of little open clusters. And we're going to pick it up with uh, M36 is the next one on our list. All right. So this is in the constellation Auriga. Uh, it's fairly close to Gemini. It's, it's really in the sky. When you're, when you're looking at Gemini and then you look over at Auriga, it's not that far. You don't have to move your scope very far. The cluster is not related. Uh, it's 4,100 light years away. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's like half again as far away. Um, but uh, in the sky, it's easy to go from M35 to M36. And then, in fact, you can then move on in more or less that same direction in a straight line, or almost a straight line, to M37 and then to M38. And uh, we're not going to show pictures of them, but they're also open clusters. Uh, in Auriga. So you'd seen the whole winter sky is just teeming with these little tiny loose clusters of stars. Yeah, and it's great. It's, uh, they're, they're real sharp in the winter sky. The, you know, they don't twinkle that much because the sky is steady and, uh, and, they t and the sky tends to be very clear. And best of all, you can see them from the Mercury Vapor Observatory. You can see them from your driveway. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a plus for me. <laughs> now the only problem is, is I'm wondering, how do you stop from getting suffering frostbite when you're out there observing in the dead of winter? Well, if I'm in my driveway, that's my front yard, yeah. right? If I get cold, I can go back inside. And, okay. You know, that's a, that's a feature. I don't drink coffee, but um, uh, uh, hot, hot cocoa, you know, a thermos of hot cocoa goes a long way. Um, I, don't, I don't drink alcohol, especially while observing, because alcohol actually uh, reduces your night vision. Uh, it's, I, I think it's kind of funny. We often observe at state parks or, or metro parks, and they'll say, you know, no alcohol. And I've never seen anyone drink anything. And at first I thought that was odd, and then I found out that, well, it's actually counter, counterproductive. It impacts the right. ability to see anything. Right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to um, talk about the last of the objects we're, talk, uh, we're talking about deep sky objects. And it's probably one of the best open clusters you can see in wintertime. Can you tell us about the Beehive? Right, the Beehive, M44. Uh, now, uh, it's in uh, Cancer. Uh, and Cancer is a fairly faint uh, constellation, but it's between a couple fairly bright constellations. So it's not as hard to find as, uh, as you might think. It is naked eye. You can see it naked eye. And I have. And, um, and it's also very near the ecliptic. So I've seen, for example, Mars come right in the same field of view as, uh, as the Beehive on occasion. And the moon as well. And the moon as well. That's right. So it's actually easier to see the cluster than it is the constellation Cancer. Is that what you're telling us? It, is, it really is easier to see the, constel the, the cluster. It really is easier to see. All right. And, and it looks great in binoculars, even very small binoculars. Any, any old binoculars you have uh, running around your uh, uh, closet, you know, that's going to be fine. Okay, very good. So this has just been a preview of some of the finest deep sky objects you can see in the wintertime. As long as you dress warmly, have your hot cocoa, or, um, um, or, um, or have something to stay warm, don't drink alcohol, and don't trip up in your yard, it's, it's a great time to look. Um, if you have a, uh, like more, more information about the show or about the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, we'll invite you to check out the website, astronomyforeveryone.org. So that's it. Uh, we're going to continue on the show with what's up in the nighttime sky. So stay tuned.
Welcome to What's Up in the Night Sky for December 2012. As is our habit, we're going to start with the phases of the moon. The month will start on the 6th with a, uh, with a third quarter phase. Um, we then move on to the 13th for the new moon, which is perfectly timed for um, a really cool event, which we'll talk about a little bit. We'll then move on to the first quarter moon on the 21st, and the full moon will be on the 28th. Now, starting in the evening sky, uh, on December the 3rd, we're going to show you the planet Jupiter. It'll be in opposition. That'll mean it'll be exactly opposite part of the sky from the sun. So it's going to be up all night long. Here you'll see it next to the bright star Aldebaran, or Aldebaran, uh, however you prefer to say it, in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Uh, on the next night, actually the next morning, um, on the 4th, Mercury will be at its greatest position away from the sun in uh, in December. So you'll see it early in the morning sky, 5 to 6 o'clock. It'll be uh, visible in the eastern horizon. Moving a week later, you're going to see a beautiful sight also in the early morning sky. You will see Venus in a very beautiful crescent moon. Um, this is two of the most important images in the religion of Islam. Uh, on the 14th, which is not very far away from the, next, the next day after a new moon, is the Geminid meteor shower, where you can see upwards of 100 shooting stars an hour. Look for the two bright stars, Pollux and Castor, the heads of Gemini, the twins, and that will be any time after midnight when you're heading into the stream of debris left behind by the comet that makes these shooting stars. On the, um, on the 18th, just four days later, the asteroid or minor planet Ceres will be in opposition. It'll be up all night long, due south. Um, use your maps because it's going to be a very faint object and hard to see. But if you look at it, you can say, hi, I saw an asteroid last night. On the 21st, it is the winter solstice for northern hemisphere, the first day of winter. If you're in Australia, you're at the beach because it's the start of your summer. Now, the 21st is also being noted by many people because it's supposed doomsday forecast by the Mayan and calendars and all the rest of that. So we want to remind you that all you have to do to look forward after that is the 28th of December for that wonderful December full moon. That's up in the night sky for uh, December 2012. The term of the month for December 2012 is open cluster. And I chose open cluster because the winter sky has lots of open clusters. And from my own perspective, you can see open clusters in a high light pollution uh, uh, location. For example, my driveway. Uh, there are about 1,100 known open clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. So there are lots of things to choose from. There are quite a few that are quite bright. There are 26 open clusters in the Messier catalog. So it's uh, fairly easy to locate them. And uh, you know there are lists that you can just go with. Uh, one of my favorite ways to uh, go out and observe is to go to the uh, skymaps.com website and download their, uh, their two-sided sheet for the month. And on the front, they've got a sky chart of the sky pretty much as it is in the 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And on the other side, they have um, lists, three lists. One is the really easy objects to see. One is the sort of the binocular objects to see. And then the more challenging uh, telescope objects. And there are often a number of uh, clusters that are uh, available in these lists. And they're actually located on the chart for you. So they're actually pretty easy to navigate to. Now, open clusters form from gas clouds. So a gas cloud, like the Great Orion Nebula, uh, which we have an image for, uh, this gas cloud will produce uh, probably on the order of 1,000 to 10,000 stars eventually. So as the gas cloud condenses in, to form a cloud, you, you get some of the, the, early, um, the early stars uh, produced. Some of the very large early stars will actually live long enough, uh, or live short enough, 
they'll have a lifespan that is short enough that they will explode as a supernova, which then has an, an effect of clearing the gas out from the gas cloud. Uh, but what happens is a number of stars form in the gas cloud, and they move together as a group. Uh, and that's because the gas was moving as a, gr as a unit. So the, uh, the stars will remain together anywhere from about a million to a hundred million years, and they'll continue moving together. But what will happen is that some of the stars will get peeled off uh, because there'll be a close interaction between two stars in the cluster, and one will get uh, too much speed, and it will actually escape the cluster. Or there'll be a nearby star. There'll be interactions with other stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and that will peel stars off. And so as time goes on, the cluster loses its stars. And all of the stars are then single stars, or or in whatever double or triple star that they were in originally. One of the reasons why we like to study uh, stars in clusters, in open clusters, is because the stars formed at around the same time, and they are the same distance from us. And so you get to compare stars against each other, and you get to do other comparisons. It makes the studies easier. Now, some of the gas stays with the cluster for up to uh, 10 million years. And in M45, that's the Pleiades, we saw how there was some nebulosity in with the stars. And this is how it would look, even though the gas in, um, in M45, in the Pleiades, is not actually associated with the original cluster that formed these stars. Now, uh, clusters can form in spiral arms of galaxies, and they can also form in galaxy centers. But you often see them in the spiral arms because uh, they hang together longer. In galaxy centers, there are interactions with a lot more of the stars because the star density toward the center of the galaxy is quite high. So they get dispersed really quite quickly. Now, the sun formed in a cluster, and in fact, some of the material in the sun and in our solar system, planets and asteroids, uh, has come from material that came from supernovas that probably happened early, uh, early in the development. Uh, we don't know of any sister stars to the sun. All of the stars have dispersed. We have no idea where any of them are. So the uh, term of the month for December 2012 is open cluster. <laughs>